Hi, this is Ren. This is Casey. And this is All Walks of Film. But today we're not talking about film. Once again, we are talking about the famous or infamous Anita Sarkeesian. Yeah, this is one of our critiques on pop culture critiques, I guess. So this episode, we're actually going to be talking about three things that she's done somewhat recently-ish. Um, one is research she conducted post-E3 failing. One is her newest episode of tro Tropes vs. Video Games? Uh, Tropes vs. Women, women in, in Video, video games. games. That's it. And then the third thing is going to be her lecture, Hate and Heroism, Why Anita Sarkeesian is So Fucking Awesome. Uh, today we're doing another piece about some of Anita Sarkeesian's work. This is actually a couple months old. This was something she posted on her website June 22nd. That was about E3, and it was a breakdown of the games that were shown at E3. The first breakdown was the gender of playable protagonist characters, and the second was violent versus nonviolent video games, basically. So to start off with, she opens with this little thing of, The Feminist Frequency team attended the Electronic Entertainment Expo E3 in Los Angeles this year to get a glimpse of the latest and greatest in gaming titles and technology. There has been a lot of discussion about the improvement scene over previous years at E3 in terms of representation of women in video games announced or presented at the show. While the presence of titles fronted and featuring women certainly was better in comparison to the past years, it also needs to be said that we have a long way to go before we come close to approaching gender equality. The following data is based on the games showcased at press conferences by Bethesda, Microsoft, Sony, EA, Ubisoft, Nintendo, and Square Enix at E3 2015. Numbers on gender. There were seven games with exclusively playable female protagonists, or 9% of the total 76 titles. This means that she's only talking about 76 games. That's not a lot of games, but she's only talking about the ones at that E3. That is a good handful that of games. That is a good handful of games, but it's not a whole lot. And I'm going to get back to why I'm bringing this up earlier. But she's only talking about 76 games. So there were seven games with exclusively playable female protagonists. That's 9%. There were 24 games with exclusively playable male protagonists, or 32% of the total 26 titles. Now, she mentioned specifically which games were centered on women, and they were ReCore, Mirror's Edge, Catalyst, Horizon Zero Dawn, Rise of Tomb Raider, the mobile game Lara Croft Go, so I guess it's two Tomb Raider games, mm -hmm. and two indie titles, Tacoma and Beyond Eyes. Again, giving the indie game special treatment over the mainstream games, but that's okay, that's her bias. There were also 35 games in which players appear to be able to choose either a man or a woman. It's always great to see more games with gender choice, and this year we saw a few blockbuster franchises like FIFA and Call of Duty at finally add playable women. Still, of those 35 titles, only Dishonored 2 used its marketing and promotional space at E3 to predominantly focus on the main character option. Which, I'm not sure what she means by predominantly focus, like if none of the other games even put in their marketing that you can have the option to play. And that's a good point. I know a lot of people are complaining, why aren't you marketing playable female characters? But it's called marketing. Right. And <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to throw out a gender bias, but it's something that I've noticed. I know a lot of women. I know a lot of women who play video games. And the video games that they play normally are not modern games. If they are modern games, they're usually cell phone games. But, but normally it's like old school RPGs. Mm-hmm. Games that are on the Super Nintendo, because Super Nintendo is super old, school uh, super old school retro, fucking hipsters love it, and Nintendo 64. So, I mean, you'll usually find women that have played The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, which is an amazing game, but it is about 20 years old. And I don't meet a lot of women that actually play modern games. Now, there are women. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. I'm, I'm just saying that most of the women that I meet don't play what everybody else is playing generally and, and statistically speaking because marketing you know marketing campaigners and people who like actually put this stuff together look at statistics over anything mm -hmm. else statistically speaking women tend to prefer games that do not have a playable character that do not have a main protagonist okay so continuing on these numbers also reflect the fact that a purely binary understanding of gender was on display at games featured at e3 with no options featured that might allow 
players to pick from a wider spectrum of gender identities or representations. There are some games that do have these options, but we're still trying to get there. We're Just out of closer. curiosity, do they have transgender options in games? I believe that there are some games that have had it in the past, but I, I don't remember if they were playable. I think that might be something that's really difficult for people who aren't really in touch with what, what the transgender movement is to really figure out. If you think about this in sort of a weird way, it's like, if you are biologically a man, but you identify as a woman, can't you just pick the female option? I think that's sort of the thinking of keeping a binary. Now I'm not justifying that, but I'm saying I think that's the thought process. But just out of curiosity, have there been any games where, like, let's say you play as a man who identifies as a woman and you have, like, manlier features with feminine features? What? I mean, I know some games offer, like, options. Like, I would say that probably the, the best example of something sort of like this is the wrestling games, just because you can do whatever the fuck you want damn near. Yeah, there In are those a lot games. of games where you can, like, actually give characters very specific features. Right. And we're getting to the point where more games are having more options on what your characters look like. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people that I love options in games. I love to design my character in some pretty crazy ways. Okay, so I pulled out this article on out.com and it's called Seven Trans Friendly Video Game Characters. It includes Super Mario Birdo, Final Fight Poison, Chrono Trigger, Flea, um, Guilty Gear, Bridget, Batten, Kaidos, Yellow, Yellow, and Tekken Leo. Oh yeah, Leo. I actually knew about that one. Anyway, oh, so was that a woman that identified as a man? Making his debut in 2007, Tekken Six, Leo sparked some controversy for the fighting series with players questioning Leo's gender, as it was never disclosed. The reasoning behind making Leo's gender ambiguous is attributed to the Bandai Namco team that wanted to create a character that would be cherished by fans regardless of gender, making Leo a trans-friendly character. Okay. However, in 2011, Leo was revealed to be female, and her full name is actually Eleonora. As the series continues to evolve, Eleonora is still fairly new. Who knows what else will be revealed? So her biological gender is female, but she identifies as a man. Yeah. That's fine. Possibly. Possibly. We don't really know. It's a video game. I mean, it's a fighting video game at that. Like, there's usually not a ton of story thrown into those games. Yeah. So then uh, Anita Sarkeesian puts this handy little graph where she, she shows that 13% was non, non applicable. So those are 13% of the games did not have a playable protagonist. Like Tetris and shit like that, right? Yeah, that sort of game. 9% were only female, 32% were only male, and 46% were either. 46%, which is almost half. Well, here's, here's what she goes on to say, and this is where I have a little bit of issue. 46% lets you have the option to basically be whatever you want on a binary scale sure but you can choose to do whatever you want to do and based on that scale most of the games give you the option well half the games which is almost half which is pretty good some may ask why it's important that there be games led exclusively by women and why we make the distinction between those games in which the sole protagonist is a woman such as mirror's edge and those in games where you have the option to play as either male or female character such as fallout 4. one reason why we need more games that are fronted exclusively by female characters is that it works to counter the long established long reinforced cultural notion that heroes are male by default by and large girls and women are expected to project themselves onto male characters but boys and men are not encouraged to project themselves onto or identify with female characters. When players are given the opportunity to see a game universe exclusively through the eyes of a female character with her own unique story, it helps challenge the idea that men can't or shouldn't identify with women, their lives, or their struggles. As long as games continue to give us significantly more stories centered on men than women, they will continue to reinforce the idea that female experiences are secondary to male ones. Stories have the power to influence our understanding of the world around us and when we can virtually embody the lives and experiences of people different from ourselves, it opens up greater possibilities for empathy and understanding. So the fact that almost half of the games give you an option to choose is still oppressive. Men need to play games where they are forced to play women, and that needs to be the way that marketing works now, because gamers are dead. 
what is wrong with choice? Why does she have to be like super, super anti-choice? Like when your entire stance on feminism is that feminism is not a personal choice and men should not have the option to play as either a man or a woman because she's specifically saying it's men who have this issue. This is an issue of men need to play as women very exclusively. This is her argument. Men need to have, need to be forced to play as women more often. It's like, why? Why can't we just choose to do whatever we want? Well, and if men come in contact with these kind of aggressive feminists, they're not going to want to play games starring female protagonists. That's just, that's just a fact. But that being said, here's the thing. Stories for video games are more often written by men, created by men, because not a lot of women enter the gaming field. We're starting to see more women become developers, and there have been in the past. There's the, uh, I forget what her name is, but she worked on the Uncharted series. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there and uh, the person who created Centipede was a woman. So, I mean, there are, and Centipede is like one of the greatest games of the of the past, too. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there there are video games that have been developed Not by women. Not to mention, the woman who developed Bayonetta, or, I mean, the person who developed Bayonetta was a woman, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, so there, there are women making games, and um, I think that it would be better for men to make games based on their own experience. It's one thing to write something with experience, you know, to create characters based on your understanding of the world. It's another thing when you don't really get another side, and then you try to make a character around that. Mm -hmm. it, it always comes off as forced. And so, like, it, it, it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Right. Uh, thing where it's it's like well i don't really know how to make a video game with a woman because my understanding of gender and all this kind of stuff might be you know this and this you know that's what a developer might think and they would just be like well i don't want to fuck it up right i don't want to do something that's going to offend people or well you should be forced to write that way even if you don't think you can do it very well because you need to throw down the patriarchy well, here's the thing. If if these women who are bitching about this shit would actually buy the games that do it, yeah, then... Yeah, vote with your wallet. Yeah, vote with your wallet. I mean, if this shit is pissing you off, then support the games that you fucking... that fucking do it. I mean, I mean, let's face it, a lot of them aren't amazing, but if you're really about that, you should support the cause. And or learn how to program within... yourself if you really care about video games. Right, especially Anita Sarkeesian, who really seems to put most of her money into indie games. That's well, a lot she of what should, she plays. She should be a story. She should be a story, uh, story supervisor for some video game because that way she'd put her money where well, her fucking I don't mouth is. Understand why she doesn't make her video game. Like she came up with the proposal for her video game. And a lot of people said <laughs> that looks like a fun video game. And yeah, a lot of people tore it apart because they were trying to make fun of her. And you know, well, I, it's I don't disagree with because that. But if she thinks that would be a good game and that's what she wants to see on the gaming industry, she has all this fucking money that she is not yeah. doing anything well, impressive with. Her game with. proposal is she, hilarious because it essentially breaks apart the complaints that she has. Exactly. So it, but, um, but my point is that aside, like criticism of her game proposal aside, she has all this money that she's not doing anything impressive with. She's complaining about how the video game industry is discriminating against women developers and the stories told in video games are discriminating against female players. Why don't you take all this money that you have and all these ideas that you have and actually make a product that you want to see on the market? Why don't you do that? Well, she's using that money for conferences. Um, she's using that money for makeup and she's using that money to buy more purple plaid t-shirts. I mean, uh, plaid shirts. That's what she's doing with her money. And those plaid shirts look damn good. <laughs> well, I don't know what she is or isn't doing with her money, but her tax breakdown looked very suspicious. Let me just say that, especially for, okay, she made as much money as the president of the United States last year, and now she's trying to say that Feminist Frequency is a nonprofit organization so she doesn't have to pay taxes. I was just kidding yeah. about the plaid shirts, by the way. They, they look terrible. Um, <laughs> okay. But uh, I like plaid shirts. I like plaid shirts, too. But, like, when you make that much money, I guess I guess it's so... It she doesn't matter down what she earth. wears. I'm sorry. I don't give okay. a shit what okay, she wears. Okay, okay, just, okay. I just... I give a shit what she says, and I give a shit about her products. <laughs> so I had a big problem with that part. But there's another half that we haven't gotten into yet. Survey on combat. Of the 76 games counted, only 18 were non-violent. 
or at least appear as if they might not have mechanics involving combat or violence. That's only 24%, meaning roughly 3 out of every 4 titles announced or showcased at E3 2015 employ combat mechanics. By this we mean that the player is either required to or can choose to engage in violence as a means of conflict resolution, not simply that violence exists within the world of the games. So that's like kind of an interesting sort of uh, criteria to me, that it's not just, oh there is violence in the games, but that's sort of like a way to resolve issues is through violence right and there are some she sees fantasy violence as an issue right that's basically what she does and there are some games that offer options Mm -hmm. on whether to uh be violent or not i know the original deus ex was was kind of famous for having a non-lethal option Mm -hmm. all the metal gear solid games have the non-lethal option but it's hard as fuck to do right well Um, she's not saying killing she's saying like violence and uh combat I mean, uh, well, there you is still no have way combat, to, but it's yeah, not exactly. lethal. Yeah, exactly. There's no way to play Metal Gear Solid without combat. Uh, well, you could sneak past the guards, but you still have the bosses. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you cannot get through a whole game without combat. Right. That 24% includes... That 24% of non-combat games includes five sports games, three racing games, two separate Animal Crossing games and a mobile game about the minions from Despicable Me movie franchise, among others. If we exclude sports and racing games, the percentage of titles without combat drops to only 15. I don't know why you would exclude sports and racing games from that, but okay. And also, like, what kind of sports games is she talking about? Is she talking about, like, what, basketball and stuff like that? Because She's talking about, like, the FIFA games. She's talking about, okay, like, those so actual sporting franchise games. Yeah, so, like, football games and stuff like that yeah. could would count uh, a as combat right for her i wouldn't think so they're sports well but like boxing and stuff like that would count as combat for her i don't know if there was a boxing game or not which is part of my issue but i'll get back to that so then she has another chart which is distinctly less impressive than her first one where she shows non-combat 24 percent combat 76 percent and that's it in compiling data on whether or not a game's mechanics incorporate violence or combat we aren't making a value judgment or saying that the cartoonish sword swinging of The Legend of Zelda is no different from the gratuitous chainsaw kills in Doom, because I do not like Doom. The numbers by themselves can't paint a complete picture. At least she admits that. Rather, these numbers are presented here only to demonstrate how prevalent violence as a mechanic is in all sorts of video games, because it is worth considering how, in relying so heavily on violence as a core component of game design, Developers and publishers are not exploring opportunities to tell other kinds of stories and create other kinds of games. When game narratives consistently take place in inescapably hostile, antagonistic environments, it severely limits the kind of stories that can be told. Now, she's not saying that other kinds of stories are non-existent. She's just saying they're limited because there is some sort of social need to include combat in all video games or something. I get the point of trying to highlight a trend, But if you look at it from the perspective of game developers are making the games, A, that they want to make, and B, that they believe will actually sell, a lot of them feature violence in a fantasy, in a video game, that's somehow damaging to other stories that don't use violence. When game narratives consistently take place in inescapably hostile, antagonistic environments, it severely limits the kinds of stories that can be told. I mean... Here's, here's the thing. In order to tell a good story, you have to have conflict. Now, that conflict doesn't have to be violent, but hostility can portray itself in different ways. It doesn't always have to be violent. One of the things that I've learned in storytelling is having the hero or heroine um, come with great adversary. Like, you know, having huge obstacles... Mm -hmm. for the protagonist to leap over is much more interesting than non-conflict narratives. Which, I mean, let's face it. I mean, like, you look at cinema by Mm -hmm. men, you look at cinema by women. Women's films are usually plotless. They're they're more character-driven than story-driven. Yeah, exactly. And I'm fine with them doing that in video games. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Most people don't like non-story-driven stories. The other thing, too, is I think comes down to gameplay mechanics is that by having combat in your games there's sort of another element to how the player can interact within the world sort of it's it's another option for them to interact with if you take that out there might be a lot less 
action that you can actually inflict upon the world, which is the whole point of having an interactive medium. And I get that she's trying to say, like, we shouldn't be dependent on that option, but I just think that when it comes to the idea of including it so predominantly, it's just a way that players can be active in the make-believe world in the video game. Right, and I mean, there is a certain trend of games now that are essentially considered walking simulators, which uh, Gone Home was right. one of those. Well, like going back to what I was saying about having that option and playing the Lego movie video game, yeah, you have all these cool things you can do. You can build, you can manipulate, you can run around and find things, you can sort of crush things, you can do a lot of different options, but when you don't have the, you know, the robots and the bad guys sort of flock on you while you're trying to do these things and you also have to fight them, the difficulty level goes way down. So I think it's just something that people put in so there's another obstacle because jumping over something is not nearly as difficult or even rewarding as, you know, having an actual conflict with something where it moves around. Like the enemies in video games, they move around. They have their own, you know, sort of movement that you can't control. It's more difficult than like simply jumping over something or moving something, even though you also have all that as well. Also, I got a question. Why doesn't Anita Sarkeesian talk about Portal more? Because that has both. It's yeah. non it's nonviolent and the lead character is a is woman. A, is a woman also um, And she has to be a woman. It's non-optional. Right. And also the the lead antagonist is voiced by a woman as well. GLaDOS. Right. And has she really mentioned sh that at all? I believe at one point she mentioned Portal in passing, but I don't oh, think she's really discussed she, Portal. She complained the fact that Shell had her uh, jumpsuit um, halfway, halfway tied in the second one. So it exposed more a more objectified... What? Yeah, she did say that at one point. Okay. Now, here, here's the thing. I was in the Navy. We we wore jumpsuits sometimes. I love sometimes. wearing my jumpsuits then, like that. <laughs> but here's the thing. When it gets really fucking hot, you do that shit. Yeah. Guy, girl, you'll do that shit. Yeah, I do that. Here's the thing. Time. I feel what? bad for women a lot of times because they don't, like, when they get hot. They can't take their shirts yeah, off. <laughs> they, there's still a level of decency that society has put on them. But here's the thing. If a woman were just to take her top off, that would be like, oh, well, she's being objectified, you know, blah, blah, blah. Man, she's fucking hot. <laughs> the medium has nearly limitless potential, and in indie games like Tacoma, Firewatch, and Beyond Eyes, we get a glimpse of what's possible when games approach human existence through a lens of empathy rather than one of violence. I haven't heard of any of those games. Well, Anita Sarkeesian really likes to promote indie games on steam no yeah indie games on steam in opposition to mainstream games which but like is half fine the, but like it's, why it's does fine but like so half the prevalent? time half the time these games are so fucking cheap that like they can't even like like these are never like mainstream games like these games well, cost the other like thing too is that five dollars well, twenty dollars at max honestly i think that's the reason why sort of as a s statistic, women aren't as willing to play modern mainstream games is because they're fucking expensive. And a lot of people, but especially women, don't want to spend $60 on a on a video game. No, they want to spend it on clothes and shit, which, I mean, let's face it. I mean, a fucking bra costs how much? If you go to Target to get like a halfway decent bra, which most people don't do, it's $15 to $25. And that's one bra by itself, usually. Yeah. Whereas guys can get like a fucking underwear, like six pack for what, $10? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And the girls underwear usually comes in three packs, by the way. Like if you get them in bulk like that, it's usually three packs. Yeah. Maybe like a five pack if you're lucky. But she definitely tries to have this whole indie gaming versus mainstream gaming, which is fine. It's just... It's, you, it's you another one to, of those things that she's to, like really biased about without admitting that she's biased about it. Yeah, I, I would like her to come out and say that she is biased or preferential to indie games. I mean, if she simply said that, hey, I want to give these games, uh, you know, a little bit of notice because not a lot of people are paying attention to them. That's fine. Here's the thing. That's when you're a media critic, even. you need to be criticizing the most mainstream shit. 
So Beyond just, there's violence, ew, gross, it's bad. If Anita Sarkeesian wanted to do her fucking job correctly, she would be breaking apart the Call of Duty games. Yeah, and what's wrong with that? She doesn't want to do that because, oh, it's too violent. I don't want to watch fantasy violence, which is yeah. a choice, fine, but... Her, no. her bias about fantasy violence is something in particular I really wish she would address publicly as a thing of, I am not going to have the same standards for a piece of a piece of media that includes fantasy violence as I am for a piece of media that does not include fantasy violence. I will have a distinct bias and have different standards. I wish she would say something like that because she does. Games have only begun to scratch the surface of what can be done, the stories that can be told, and the experiences that illumin that can be illuminated when combat isn't employed as a linchpin of game design. Which, by the way, isn't there combat in her video game proposal? Yes. Isn't that a primary mode of conflict resolution? I do believe so. Because she escapes with violence. She's trying to escape from people who are trying to find her because she's wanted in her own country. I mean, there's a lot of parts of the story that don't have violence in it, but isn't that like one of the original things you have to do is employ violence? <laughs> as a means of conflict resolution? Yes. Fully realizing this potential requires that game creators continue exploring the possibilities, investing in innovative mechanics and storytelling techniques to push the medium forward. Unless she changed her mind, which she would need to come out and offer a new proposal. And that's fine too. I don't care if she wants to do a new game, but if she wants like all the stuff on the market and she wants to make proposals for get for video games, I don't understand why she doesn't like work on making one, especially since she is so into indie games. Like why doesn't she make an indie game for Steam? Like that would be awesome. Yeah, or like Even if least... I didn't like it, that would be cool that she did something. Yeah, she could totally fucking kickstart her game and it would be made. Well, I would <laughs> Honestly, I would whether, kind of disagree whether, with her kickstarting it because she she already has well, enough funds for it. Come on. Well, here's the thing. Um, she shouldn't be allowed to work on it because, I mean, let's look at her Feminist Frequency video games. You wouldn't see that video game until about, like, 10 years. Oh, that's true. Like, that <laughs> video game might not ever come out. Yeah. I personally think that Feminist Frequency should be a brand, not a person. I agree. I really wish that she had more people. And even if they were only women, whatever. Or Macintosh. Or Macintosh. <laughs> whatever. Like, have some alternating opinions other than yours. And considering the fact that, okay, what's her tagline? Feminist frequency, conversations with pop culture, where I am the only voice and I disable all the comments and I don't talk to other people. And even when I go on a panel, I don't actually engage with other people. It's just me. I'm the only voice that matters. Where's your conversations? Even if you only want to pick one or two other people to have these conversations with, do it! That would be cool. Well, what what the title should actually be is Feminist Frequency, Poorly Researched Lectures About Pop Culture. <laughs> Primarily video games. She's talked about some other stuff, but you know, she gets on video games because let's face it, if she got in if she really got into feminist criticism on films, there's a lot of literature that would fucking destroy her shit. Yep. Because I've I've read some feminist literature on uh, films and it's actually really interesting. And there are some really strong feminist films that I've seen. So just in closing, there were a couple other points about this. Right in between her two sort of sections of this, she puts, here's a bit of info on how we came up with our data because she's really under fire for how she does her research, as I feel like she should be. We counted only those upcoming games which were given full trailers, announcements, or demonstrations on stage, so games that only that only appear briefly in montages or sizzle reels are not included. Fair enough. Games in which you lead a party made up of male and female characters, but which center squarely on a male character, such as Final Fantasy VII, are counted as male-led games because it's cloud story. Wow, that sounds like such a such a newly relevant game. Yeah. I mean, I know that they're making she, well, the remake. She picked, well, she picked it, A, because they're making the remake, and B, because that's something that most nerds are familiar with, the structure of the gameplay. So it makes sense that she brought that one up. And it's unfeminist because Tifa's tits are too big. You said that. I didn't. <laughs> Tifa's tits are fine. I'm going to say that. Well, yeah. I mean, Gaijin Goomba was talking about uh, Tifa's tits uh, at one point because they, they are a subject of a conversation. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Uh, I'm some, just saying uh, you brought people, it up. I yeah. didn't. I feel like what she should have said instead of this is Cloud Story because I don't feel like that's entirely true Final no, Fantasy No, it's VII. fucking Eris Story. Yeah, right? But I think she, sh she should have mentioned not male-led games, but with playable characters 
Because Cloud is the playable character of I don't know, it's a fucking RPG. Whenever you get into combat... Yeah, but combat is not part of the storytelling. There's not, like, parts of the story where you're wandering around as Aerith. I think Mm, that's more I think that there are a couple points in the game where you do actually play as Aerith. But, like, throughout the majority of the game? No. No, the majority of the game, you have to play as Cloud. But here's the thing. The game came out when? 1997. No, but, like, I think she, she was just bringing it up because... Structurally, we all understand how Final Fantasy VII works. That's how you and I are having this conversation right now. So I think she should have made more of a point of playable character versus whose story it is, because that can sort of be up for interpretation. Like when you say, oh, Last of Us is Joel's story. Well, not really. It's Joel and Ellie's story. It's both of their story. It's their story together and it's their story separate. And they're both playable characters. Yeah. Like, I think it needs to be more about playable character and not whose story it is. Okay. Anyway, additionally, we are well aware that Yoshi's gender has been discussed and debated, but Nintendo's use of male pronouns when referring to Yoshi. So for our purposes here, Yoshi's Woolly World, which looks delightful, is classified as a male-led game. So we can still maintain the NA, there is no gender. There is only the binary. I, I'm sure she liked the 98 Godzilla because they turned Godzilla, who was a known male character... And made Godzilla female. Well, a lot of fans are debating that no, Godzilla was not a female in that movie. He was a species that the The men can procreate, which I really highly fucking doubt that the people who wrote That's a Lot of Fish actually put that much thought into it. I consider Zilla, not Godzilla, or Gino, you can call him, you can call her Gino, Godzilla in name only. I view her as a girl because I highly, like, I don't think there was a part of the movie where they specifically said him or her, or, like, they changed it after they found the X. I don't think, like, they kept calling Godzilla him after that, or if they specifically said he is a male who can lay eggs. But in any case, I'm pretty sure that means that Godzilla is a female. I prefer to think of it that way. Chino. Anyways, my other thing about this is I kind of wish she listed the games since there were 76 of them, and that's not a whole lot, and sort of said, this game was female-led and had combat options. You know, that sort of thing. She's done that before in her video about Oscar-winning movies for Best Picture that passed or failed the Bechdel test. She goes back a few decades throughout all the movies saying, this is specifically the way it worked, and this is why this one's kind of iffy. Like, she's done that before, and this is an article. It wouldn't take up, like, too much video time just put a list at the end that's kind of nitpicking i just personally would have preferred it it's not a real criticism it's just a preference that would have been nice for me yeah well my favorite thing is the moment that she was on the stephen colbert show and uh stephen colbert is like you talk about these video games um that have these things can you can you name three Mm -hmm. and then she's like um you know and then she's she's just you know talking like a fucking puppet and um grand theft auto five well, actually, Three times. she didn't mention the Grand Theft Auto. She just referred to Grand Theft Auto, all of them. Yeah, as a know, franchise. Okay. As a franchise. Which, even that, she should have said, like, the Grand Theft There's Auto franchise, franchise instead of Name Grand Theft more. Auto. Yeah. <laughs> Name, Name two, two more. more. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, you talked about Hitman. What, did you forget that you talked about Hitman? Well, even though I just... <laughs> Tours us all apart, especially the part where she criticizes games for giving players of either gender an option or of any gender, not either. Because I I agree with her that there is no gender binary, but anybody can play whatever game she was, including her indictment of that. This is a step in the right direction. I mean, granted, it's like middle school level research projects, but it's actual research she's conducting for once. That's something. Yeah, I mean, let's give credit where credit is deserved. Like, I would love to see her do more of this and do it better so I can't tear it apart as much. Or to maybe see somebody else on YouTube do much better than her. Please, (laughs) please. I want want Anita Sarkeesian to inspire somebody who's smarter than her. Mm -hmm. To basically beat her at her own game. That would be really nice. Um, Now I'm going to come out and say, being the girl on this program... I'm not doing that because that's not my career goal. Just saying. Like, I, a lot of people are like, oh, well, and especially since I'm criticizing Anita, oh, well, why don't you be the change you want to see in the world? Well, 
Casey, why don't you be the change you want to see in the world? Dude, I'm a working student and like that is not my area of expertise. You know, I'm not going to bitch about the lack of female directors when I changed my major from directing, you know? Yeah, I might call you out on that, but... (laughs) Well, I don't bitch about the lack of female directors because I truly believe you can't just make female directors appear out of nowhere. Right. You know, like you can't have half of movies come out be made by female directors if female directors are like females are not coming forward trying to get that job and i'm saying that based on our college yeah where, like, I mean, when i look around in my classrooms besides me you know like when i was taking directing classes there were only a small handful of other girls who were not interested in directing nobody's telling girls in a highly metropolitan area at a liberal arts college that does not have an anti-female agenda Right. Oh, you can't direct. You can't do screenwriting. It's just women are human beings, just like any other kind of people who make their own life choices. And if statistically speaking, they are not drawn into directing, they don't need to be pushed into directing for the sake of it. You know, if they want to do it, go do it. Be the next Jennifer Kent and be fucking awesome. But if you don't want to do it, I'm not going to indict you for not wanting to do it. Yeah, I mean, and let's face it. I mean, most of the, most of the women who do actually get into directing are interested in documentary. Yeah, that's true. And a lot of people sort of don't consider that in the same realm as directing films, which I think is ridiculous, especially since there's a lot of female directors. It it is a different medium. It's a totally different medium, but like it's still filmmaking. It's still filmmaking, but it's... I would say I would say that uh, I would say that documentary is more free form and mm-hmm. and directing uh, narrative films are are a lot more controlled environment like yeah um, documentary is more something that you work on after the fact like you you gather the data and then you arrange the data whereas narrative films have an intended goal I mean sometimes documentaries aren't actually documentaries <laughs> they're they're more like just films that are that are shot with the story in mind i mean prime example is borat because like yes yeah. it's a mockumentary <laughs> but they actually shot the shit you know out in public and didn't but know they what had... was gonna happen and just right. went with it yeah so anyway um so i know it just took this for this apart and i dared to criticize anita sarkeesian because i expect better i if she did better like she's been doing with, I really disagreed with a lot of the shit she said about the Scythian on her own basis. But like with Beyond Good and Evil, I kind of wanted to support that. Because I was like, I like what you're saying here. Although, let me just make one point. There's two things in there I disagreed with. And one of them was her clip showing Jade and her uncle having a mutually respected relationship was the uncle says, oh, thank you so much for saving my life. And she says, hey, yeah, yeah, just shut up. And I'm like, that's mutually respected relationship? Wow. Like, that was a poorly chosen clip. But yeah. besides that, I really liked what she said. It looked like she played the game. She had better arguments. I disagreed with the part where she said, you know, having a male in distress is not a problem because men are not in power. That whole thing. I was just kind of like, Ugh. But overall, it was a much better video than she's done in her Tropes vs. Women series. It was a big improvement, and it came out really fast after her last one. I really wanted to support it, but I can't because she won't let me. But I want her to get better. I do. If she gets better, I will give her credit where it's deserved. Because don't you know she's afraid that the harassment of women is too strong, Mm. and the death threats are so prevalent that she's afraid. What you do is you set your settings to, you know, comments... By approval only. Onision fucking did this shit. Set it by approval only. Have the admin yeah, to just put the you problem You can actually one. filter That's out funny. words. Yeah, you can filter out words. You can, And yeah, it's censorship. But here's my thing. Her setup right now is that her main platform is YouTube. She's disabled thumbs up and thumbs down. She's disabled comments. What this means is that the way I feel about this, me personally, is that what this means is that if you are a fan of hers and you want to support her or... If you're not a fan of hers and you want to tell her you like this product, please do more of it. You can't tell her. You can't support her. You're just paying She does have an email, but she won't comment back. No, she won't respond. She won't respond. She has a Twitter. She won't respond. No. Um, But you can't... If you like her and you want to support her on YouTube because you don't like Twitter, like me. (laughs) Because I would have... I really would have commented on the um, Jade video and been like... 
I really like what you did here, this and this. I would love to see more. I would have done that if she let me. But what that says is if you're a supporter of hers and you want to show her your support, your option is to watch more YouTube videos and put more money in her pocket. If you don't like her, if you want to give her valid criticism, if you want to send her horrible, hateful things, if you want to thumbs down her, you can't even say, oh, hey, I just like this. You can't even do that. If you want to say that you don't like her product or you disagree with something she says or you want to actually post an argument, you can't do that, but she will take the money from your view. I don't like that. I really dislike that. As somebody who would like to at least, if you want to censor it and only put the support, at least you're creating a community with your supporters. At least you're encouraging the conversation, so to speak. That's her conversations with pop culture. Just do it. Just do it. Do it! <laughs> so, what do you think? Uh, leave comments below. What we said right, tell us what we said wrong. You know, be part of a dialogue. Anita Sarkeesian doesn't want conversation, but we do. Yes. Yes, please. Lots of conversation. Even if you disagree with us, just actually, like, talk to us about it. Yeah, and... We'll be nice. <laughs> we, we won't bite. We've said this before, but if you're going to comment, please cite what you're commenting on and what you're criticizing on instead of just throwing out blanket statements because it does not it, it's it, it makes you look bad in the in the long run well also it's it's not helpful to us either no it isn't like if you want us to think about something or mention something like talk to us about it we're here we'll talk thanks for listening